Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Morning. This mic's on or not, it doesn't sound like it is. He'll, he'll be mic'd up, but I'm, just for the introduction, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit louder. I um, want to welcome everyone here this morning. We have a guest speaker with us here today, uh, both for class, and then also he will be presenting our sermon for us later. I want to introduce to you Bill Wharton. Um, uh, he is uh, um, here with us this morning. His friends call his name's William Wharton, but his friends call him Bill. What can we call you? Bill. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, a little bit about him. Bill retired in 2010 after more than a 50-year career in administration and research at the, in the University uh, System of Florida. He had been doing short-term mission work for many years in China, South America, Africa, and Central America, and the Caribbean, Russia, and Ukraine. A busy man. But in recent years, he's been devoting about all of his time to serving as an evangelist, Bible teacher, and biblical counselor on behalf of the people of Ukraine. Today, he's going to give us a report of the work he and his wife, Luba, are doing in the Ukraine, especially from their most recent trip to that country in November. So uh, I'll word us in a prayer before we start, and then take right on over. Let's, let's bow. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, for the opportunity to come here, uh, to join together, to encourage one another in fellowship, uh, to worship you, and then right now, specifically to learn about this work that's going on in the Ukraine. I uh, pray that you would bless uh, Bill as he speaks to us. Uh, we're thankful for him being here. Lord, we're thankful for you lo- how you love us, and we're always just thankful for how you're willing to forgive us. In Jesus' name. And when does the class end? Uh, it ends 10.15. 10.15, yeah. okay. All right, good. Good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Appreciate having the opportunity to speak to all of you, and I congratulate you on being here an hour early. Uh, I woke up at 4 a.m., and I was thinking, did I change my clock or not? I And that's a little bit disconcerting when you know you have to be somewhere and it's an important place to be. And you don't know what time it is. But fortunately, uh, I was staying with uh, Jack and Beth and they got up at a certain time and they didn't ask me when I got up, but uh, at least I was up plenty early enough. So it's good to see you. And I hope that you are going to say when we get through with the class that it was worth your while uh, to be here and not only to meet with other Christians, but also to hear a little bit about Ukraine. Yes, sir. All right, ramp me up. Is that better? Is that better? Can you hear me better now? Okay. All right. I I do have a a voice that can be louder, but I didn't realize I needed to use it. Okay, now you're going to hear uh, some things this morning in the class that I will also allude to in the sermon, so I hope that you don't mind if uh, you see some of the same pictures and hear some of the same words. Um, Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I've heard about your work. You have uh, been involved in missions for a long time, and I appreciate that because we all have a consciousness of the need of other people in the world who have not yet heard the gospel and who need to learn about Jesus. Um, when, uh, when I first learned about you, uh, it was when uh, my college roommate was uh, David Hadwin, and his, his parents lived here, and uh, her, his dad was the preacher for the church. Uh, that's a long time ago, probably before the time of most of you. Uh, but at least it was an opportunity. I came over here a few times uh, because he was my roommate, and I lived at West Virginia at the time, so it was nice that uh, I had a place I could go and sort of consider a second home. Um, So I want to talk with you about what I believe is a common goal, uh, actually a common passion. Uh, We are... We're followers of Jesus. All of us are followers of Jesus. And he was very specific when he was about to leave this earth. 
what he wanted his followers to do. And I just want to uh, uh, try to coordinate my comments with, uh, with the slides. Uh, if I can think, uh, there we go. Uh, the Great Commission is uh, sort of our marching orders. And I like to go to the Matthew version of the Great Commission. And you can either turn to your book or uh, I'll read it to you. Uh, where he said, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You notice that he, in this version of the Great Commission, he says that we're to go to all nations. And the uh, country of Ukraine is a nation. I wanted to also call your attention to the fact that in the 10th chapter of Acts, when the Apostle Peter went over to visit with Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, and Peter had had to be encouraged by the Holy Spirit to go over because Peter was a very devout Jew and didn't really believe that he should spend any time at all with Gentiles. And you remember the fact that the Holy Spirit gave him three visions that finally convinced him that it was okay for him to go and spread the gospel even to uh, pagans. Uh, that's, by the way, we're all, we were all pagans, weren't we, at one time. Uh, not something to be proud of, but something to acknowledge. But let me just read some excerpts from his sermon, which I think are very illustrative of the kind of thing that we need to develop a passion for if we haven't already. Beginning in verse 34 of chapter 10, he says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Verse 35, 36, As for the word that he sent to uh, Israel, preaching good news of peace uh, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he commanded us, moving down to verse 42, to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So you can see that Peter acknowledges the fact that uh, there is a need for all the nations to receive the gospel. And I think that I'm preaching here to the church because you already know that that's what the Bible teaches. I think we all need to be reminded now and then that uh, all nations in this world are entitled to receive the gospel and given an opportunity to believe and obey it. So the work in Ukraine is based squarely on uh, the fact that we have this obligation. Um, so where is Ukraine? Well, uh, I happen to have a little uh, pointer here. Um, if you look at the map of, of Europe, wow, that this works. Uh, right there is Ukraine. You've heard about Crimea and how Russia has taken Crimea from Ukraine. That's Crimea right there. And this is the country of Ukraine. It's, it's the largest country in Europe. Um, of course, Russia has more real estate in Europe, but it is mainly uh, in Asia, the country of, of uh, Ukraine is. But Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is the largest. If you look at all those different countries in Europe, it's the largest one. And now I'm going to see if I have technology enough to get both of these to work at the same time. Uh, so here is a bigger picture of Ukraine, which um, gives you an idea of the countries that are around it. You see Russia surrounds about a third of the country of Ukraine. Then up here, here you have Belarus and Poland, and then down here is Slovakia, Romania, and then, of course, down here is the Black Sea. If you go across the Black Sea, you come to Turkey and so it's kind of nestled there among a lot of countries that we don't hear a lot about, but it is an important country. 
Uh, it has, it's about the size of Texas, uh, and it has a population that's about twice the amount that's in Texas. And therefore, uh, it's an important place because there are a lot of people who live there. And while we've only been doing mission work in Ukraine for something like 30 years at most, uh, we uh, do have a heritage of doing some things there because we used to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union through uh, Eastern European Mission. I think you all are familiar with that organization. Uh, they are still very active. They provide Bibles for me to use, and also a lot of uh, educational materials that I use are provided by EEM. And so uh, I can assure you that they're doing a great work and have now for a long time. But even with all of the spread of Bibles and educational materials and missionaries, we still have a lot of uh, virgin territory there that we need to be dealing with. So, um, when Ukraine shook off the dominance of Moscow in 1991, there was a flood of people who came in uh, to Ukraine to, uh, to tell people about the gospel. Let's see here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is a picture here of uh, the downtown area of Ivano-Frankivsk, which is uh, in the western part of Ukraine. Uh, I've been doing a good bit of work there for the last uh, five years because there's a war going on uh, in eastern Ukraine. And we are pretty much blocked from doing much personally, uh, that is, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, in that part of Ukraine. But we still are doing some things there, which I'll tell you about later on. But uh, we are, uh, ordinarily, when we go to Ukraine, we do spend about two-thirds of our time in western Ukraine, which is uh, identified right now as ivano Frankis. Um, it used to be dominated by uh, uh, the, the Austrians. Uh, this ivano Frankis indicates that there was somebody there named Ivan uh, who was very important, but the Frankis means that it was from that French and Hungarian uh, combination of countries back a couple of centuries ago. But it is a modern uh, western city. Uh, there are no, there's no war there. Uh, it's a place that is safe. I've been there several times. And it's a place that I take people to do work alongside us. Uh, most of our group work is done in a Bible camp in one of the public schools there, uh, which is uh, the number one school in the city. They invited us to come. And we do uh, do a lot of Bible teaching in the school, but we do it at the last uh, week of the school term. So we get students who are happy to be finished with required work, and so they're able to come to us and we're able to teach them on their free time. And they enjoy the, the camps because we are not only entertaining, but we are also very instructive in the Bible, which they have not had instruction in before. So this is something that we do recruit Americans to go and help us. Uh, we probably need to have perhaps 16 more people in order to go this summer for our camps. So if you are uh, healthy and if you think you'd like to go over and spend some time working with us there with the young people, uh, see me after uh, the service today and I'll be glad to tell you more about that and also uh, give you uh, some encouragement uh, to come and be with us. Um, so I'm going to just go through some of my slides and I'm going to just tell you a little bit briefly about what's, what's going on. Um, this is a, a, a picture of the Carpathian Mountains, which is very close to ivano Frankivsk. Uh, it's a mountainous area, and also it is a rather uh, tr uh, uh, traditional four-mountain type uh, architecture. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, when we were over there in November, that was the time of the first snow. Uh, they have ski. Uh, 
skiing there and uh, with ski lifts and all that goes with it. Uh, but we were doing a good bit of our teaching in the city of Ivano Frankivsk. Uh, here we are hosting a group of uh, translators who were from a university there in Ivano Frankivsk. They are very uh, fluid in their uh, knowledge of English and uh, Ukrainian, well, and also Russian. So they have three languages that they're able to use. On the right here, you see that we were teaching a Bible class for adults. These Bibles they're holding up were provided by Eastern European Mission. Um, we went out to a village, and at that village, we were able to uh, have lunch, which, by the way, we provided the food. Uh, but they enjoyed the food, and also then they wanted to hear what we were doing. And so they sat probably for two hours listening to me talk. And you don't have to spend that much time listening to them. Uh, um, but they were very interested. They asked a lot of questions. Uh, on Wednesday night, we had a Bible class. Uh, the church has rented a, uh, an area in an office building there in the city. And they are in the process of building a building. I'll show you in a few minutes about that. Um, the uh, lady who is doing the translating there is my wife, Luba. Uh, she is a, a, a Ukrainian by birth, and I like to explain to people that she has become a US citizen and she followed all the rules. She was not undocumented. Uh, uh, so there you go. Um, okay. Uh, the church there is uh, fairly large. A lot of people show up on Sunday morning for worship. On the right, we had been invited to the home of uh, one of the members. Uh, the guy that's on the far right is an officer in the um, Ukrainian government, and the lady standing next to him is his sister, who visited the church and invited us to come over. Uh, this man has invited us to come and visit him in Kiev the next time we're over there. And as I say, he has a, a high-level job in the government. Who knows what this will lead to? Uh, this couple we baptized uh, in November, uh, they, uh, excuse me, in October, and um, they are from another city, but Luba has known them almost all of her life, and uh, they have uh, valued the fact that, uh, that she is a Christian and they wanted to have what she has, namely peace as a Christian. And this picture was taken, as you can tell, I'm in my undershirt there. I had just baptized them. I think we were all wet. Um, the uh, church then was gathered uh, the next evening, and uh, the man that's on the left, not the far left, but with the coat and tie, uh, the lady by him is his wife. Uh, he is the minister for the church there. I work alongside the preachers that are already there, the native preachers, because I have found that it's a lot more effective if we are working in partnership with them. And this is another picture of the church. And uh, you would think that I was doing all the preaching, but it's when I'm there that I do all the preaching. Uh, because they seem to think that I can preach because I'm from America. But I think that their preacher does a fine job. He's just being very gracious to let me do the preaching. And then here uh, we're baptizing a couple more people. These two ladies, well, this is just one lady there that we're getting baptized. The man on the right is one of the leaders in the church. This is the first time he had ever baptized anybody. And I like to get uh, all of the members that, that uh, are willing to get them involved in, in things that the church is doing. He was excited that he got to baptize this lady. And this is another lady who was a friend of hers, Ludmilla, uh, is a fine woman who kept asking me, well, tell me about baptism. Can you imagine meeting somebody and the first thing they ask you is tell me about baptism? I was glad to tell her about baptism. And she said, okay, I wanted to know about that. And I thought, was this just an academic question? Well, the next time we came back, she sought me out and she says, I want to be baptized. Well, then we had a question. How much does she know? 
what does she think about baptism and how does she understand that? So we spent two or three visits with her and I was finally convinced that she understood and she knew what she wanted to do. So we rented a pool at one of the hotels. The church doesn't have a baptistry. So uh, we baptized her and uh, the same gentleman that I was telling you about, now he's, he's got some experience. And so he was more comfortable with baptizing her. Picture after the baptism. They always do that and always sing. And this, this is a preacher's wife here reading a poem uh, for uh, the, the, lady that, the ladies that have just been baptized. And they are, as I indicated, they're in the process of building a building uh, largely with money coming from churches in the United States. They, uh, they are, they're ambitious about that. And here's a picture of the church that's in the process of being built. Now, what they do is they get money, they buy bricks, they buy mortar, and they work until the money's gone. And then when they get some more money, they re resume building. And we met that Wednesday night for prayer on behalf of the building program that they're involved in. Now, I want to talk about Eastern Ukraine. That was all in Western Ukraine that I was telling you. Now I'm going to tell you about Eastern Ukraine, which is not good, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this is one of the major employers of uh, the city in Eastern Ukraine, uh, which is, uh, we used to call it uh, Zhrzhensk. Now it has a, a Ukrainian name, which I'll give to you in just a moment. But uh, there were 2,500 people that lost their jobs when that mine closed, mainly because of the war. It's closed because all of the, the markets for their coal has, have disappeared, and so they didn't have any purpose in keeping them on the job. And as you can see, there is destruction over there. Uh, back some years ago, I was there, and I planted some of these birch trees, and they have actually grown from little uh, saplings up into real trees. Um, here's a building that got hit by a bomb. Uh, here's a, an office building that also was destroyed. Here's another one. I mean, that's that one city. This is Toretsk is the name of the city. And what we took with us uh, was minor stuff. You know, we took socks, we took uh, medical supplies and so on, whatever we could put in our bags to give away. And then we took the socks to school and we gave every kid there a pair of socks. And they, they don't have the money to buy socks. So we just give them socks. Um, and they even had fun with them. And uh, Lubu has her head turned. I didn't get a good picture of her, but she's there interacting with the children who have received the socks. Now here is where we went then to see the children who are being fed. We, we feed 158 school children every day, uh, yes, every school day, and it costs us about a dollar for each child. So that means that we have to have $158 available every day in order to keep the children fed. These are the poorest of the poor. They are selected by a committee of teachers and parents and administrators there, so that they, and then they give us the data showing how poor those families are. And so the 158 kids are all coming from the very poorest segment of that community. Uh, the, the, uh, the city provides a meal for the elementary school children. They go home around uh, one o'clock, so they are just given a snack but we provide a full lunch for middle and high school children. Here at school 10, we're feeding 70 children. Uh, and we, over in school 16, uh, we're feeding 30 children each, each day. These are high school and middle school children. And I just like to show, I, I really enjoy showing you pictures of the kids eating. When I'm standing there looking at them eating, I can't help it. The tears are flowing down my face because I know that in many cases, this is the only meal they're going to have that day. And so when I see them, they, they have a small plate. It's not a dinner plate. It's about this big. And 
uh, we, what we do is uh, we pay a, a dollar and we, they just pile that up with food, uh, potatoes or whatever, plus uh, protein like eggs or meat. Uh, all of it is food that they want and they clean all their plates. Never see anything thrown in the garbage. So, you, you know, if kids eat all the food, you know they're hungry. And uh, that's certainly true there. And we, we could feed more, but the school says, you know, we want to make sure that the ones we really do feed are the ones that are in most danger of not being able to even come to school. So, in fact, we got started in this back several years ago because the schools came to us and said, look, we have children that are fainting in the hallways because they haven't had any breakfast and they're not going to have any lunch. Can you help us? Well, they knew that I was a softy, so I said, we'll do something about it. And so far, uh, Christians here in America have responded to our, our, the need, and we are glad that they have. Uh, got a smile on the faces there, the children. This young woman on the right, I believe, is going to be the next Nobel winner. I don't know what field, but she just looks like a scholar to me. Uh, we went to school 13, and this is a first grade class that we're visiting. And this little boy was enduring our time there. We were talking about things, and we were greeting the teachers and all that sort of thing. And he kept raising his hand. He wanted to do something. And she kept ignoring him. The teacher did. Finally, she turned to him, and she said, well, what would you like? And he says, I, wanna, I want to pre present a skit. He didn't say that in English. Um, but he wanted to present a skit. And so the children had been learning a, a skit. And so he's now the MC. He is, he is uh, announcing the skit. And when he sat down, he was really happy. He had gotten to do that and show off for these Americans that couldn't even speak his language. So we, we had a congregation there in Torets that we helped to establish back some years ago. And this is one of the few churches that still are existing in that eastern area. And so we went to see them. Most of them are, most of the people there are women, as you can see. Uh, one young man is uh, standing close to his mother. Uh, and that's, he's the only man that uh, has grown up in the church. Over on the far left, uh, here, here. Oops. On the far left, this gentleman is the preacher. He's a medical doctor in Torets, full time, but he also does all the preaching and the teaching uh, for that church. They're not not all the members of the church are there, but most of them are. The lady right here is a doctor we took with us. She has been there before, but she is a medical doctor who. Uh, is very much concerned about the welfare of the adults and children there. And so we were happy to have her go with us. She went over to the hospital with us and to check out all the needs. And she says they need everything. So we are trying to get donations for the hospital. Um, and I think there we go. Uh, we also went to the elderly and disabled home there to, uh, to visit them. And uh, they are, some of them are not able to get out of the bed. There are some who are um, ambulatory, but most of them are not. This doctor has a good way with uh, elderly people. So, um, what I'd like to do now is just kind of review with you very quickly the main elements of our ministry. Um, as you can see here, we, we're doing Bible teaching, preaching, and biblical counseling. Uh, we try to work with churches who are there in their evangelistic outreach and uh, help them to uh, build a facility for them to meet in. In the summer, we take Americans over there uh, who are able to conduct Bible camps. 
The director of those Bible camps is um, Mike Lawson, who lives in the Nashville area. He has taken that over. He's doing a tremendous job in it. And also, he's responsible for organizing the Summer Mountain Retreat for adults. Um, we're supporting orphans in uh, Toretsk and Sumy and Bakhmut. Um, the, that work with orphans has been uh, really enabled by several congregations who really want to help orphans. And a church in uh, the Mount Dora area has sent us a lot of clothes, warm clothes, uh, for these children. Uh, we're feeding the poorest children in Tourette's. Uh, we're distributing humanitarian aid to war refugees. There are some people who have been forced out of their homes and out of their uh, areas, and they need to have help. Uh, and so we are arranging for help to get there. Some of it comes in by shipments by sea, and we take things there. So um, we arranged uh, last summer for uh, the mayor's office to buy a lot of uh, things that were needed, like cleaning supplies and clothing and so on. And then when we got there, uh, they distributed all of that to representatives from these families. Uh, so we're trying to work with the people who are on site, uh, where they have the connections, in order to uh, help the church as well as individuals who do not have an affiliation with the church. I think that uh, you remember I introduced my comments this morning by pointing out that Jesus was described as somebody who went around doing good. Well, I think that's a part of evangelism, to go about doing good. Um, okay, let me keep going here. So, that's what we do as Christians. We go about doing good. We tell all nations about him. We make disciples of all nations. And so my lingering question to you then would be, uh, would you like to join us in this mission? So uh, I think we have a few more minutes, so I'd be glad for you to ask questions. I assume this is a class where you can speak up if you want to, and I'd be glad to answer your questions. Yes. All right, um, you can contact me because I'm sort of the, the leader of this ministry. But uh, Mike Lawson, who lives in the North City, Tennessee, is the one who is out beating the bushes trying to find people to go with him. And I'll give you his address. And he would love, love to hear from you, yes. Uh, in uh, Eastern Ukraine, the dominant language is still Russian. But in Western Ukraine, for example, uh, if you speak Russian, you'll be understood. But they want you to speak Ukrainian. Ukrainian uses basically the same alphabet, but it is not the same language. Uh, there's a lot of differences between it and Russian. Uh, and in fact, my wife had to learn Ukrainian in order to help me with this ministry because she only took Ukrainian like we would take like French or Spanish or something in high school. And then when you get finished, what can you do? Uh, you can say you took it. <laughs> but she's had to learn uh, Ukrainian uh, like on the job, as it were. By the way, my wife wanted to come to this meeting today, but she is on a special assignment from the Department of Defense teaching Russian to uh, military officers who are going to be placed in, in places like uh, embassies and so on where Russian is needed, and so she's teaching Russian for the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. And she'll be out there until uh, sometime in May. So uh, she apologizes for not being here with you, but uh, she usually goes with me everywhere I go. That's what I like. Yes? It's pretty accessible. Um, for one thing, um, we are now uh, 
distributing Bibles, Bibles to every school in the country through Eastern European mission. And that's because there is a desire in the government, the central government in Kiev, for these Bibles to be made available. We're also going to be uh, teaching teachers how to teach a series of lessons on, on um, character building. And this is also going to be required in the curriculum by the country. So uh, we are simply uh, allowing ourselves to be tools to distribute this information that's drawn from the Bible uh, to people who are assigned to teach. Now, we don't know how that's going to work out uh, because obviously you can give people material and you can teach them how to teach it, but then if you're not there to monitor it, you don't know whether it's being taught appropriately or not. We know of one situation, for example, where uh, well, I won't say which denomination, but there was a denominational person who came in and basically hijacked uh, our material and was teaching the, the uh, doctrine of that particular uh, de denomination. But we try to avoid that because what we're trying to do is to make sure that we are training teachers in localities where there is already a church so that there can be a monitoring of what's going on. But the government... Uh, the central government is considered to be rather uh, corrupt by the people who live there. But we have found that here in Torres, for example, if we say, here's what we want to do, uh, like we bought uh, carpet for the, the home for aged and disabled people, and we arranged for the director, who was a schoolmate of my wife, to go and buy the, the materials, make sure they got put down, got receipts for everything, gave all those receipts to us, and we paid for that work to be done. So we try our best to eliminate the possibility of corruption because we believe that the best thing for us to do is to work with the government when we can to make sure that they are partners with us rather than enemies. Um, I know that's not totally reassuring because people are people, and... Uh, I know that a lot of people have said, well, we wouldn't trust the government as far as we could throw them. But we've found that there are good people who work in government who want to do the right thing. And if we, if we make it clear that we are getting paid nothing for what we do and that they are being trusted, entrusted with these resources in order to, to help the people that they are trying to take care of, that we, we've found that this works out pretty well. So while we can't get in there as much as we can in western Ukraine, we do have enough friends there that we can go when we need to go. One other question sometimes is asked, well, how do we get money in there? Well, I've tried every technique that I know of. I've, I've sent uh, Western Union money. Uh, I have sent uh, money grams. I have I've taken in thousands of dollars in cash. All of those are unsuccessful as far as a long-term uh, method. And so what I have done is I have given a debit card to the people who are providing the meals, and they just take the debit card to an ATM, draw out cash in their kind of cash, which are the, uh, what everybody has to use there rather than dollars. And then when that money goes out of the, my account, at that instant, it shows up on my credit union account as money going out. At the end of the month, I get a financial statement from the, the vendor showing exactly who was fed, what, uh, how much it cost, uh, when they got the money, how much money is left in their account. And then I check back with the directors of the schools and I ask them, did, did that many children actually get fed? And are you satisfied with the quality of the meals that are being provided? And so I have, a, I have two tracks of, of accountability on the money. And I know that it's, it's a dangerous thing to be responsible for what amounts to thousands of dollars, but uh, I think at this point we're doing the best we can and it seems to be working. That's probably more than you wanted to know.
No. Yeah. Well, you're right. Uh, as I said, uh, finally, Western Union said, we're not going to do it anymore because we think you could be laundering money. Uh, the same thing happened with MoneyGram. Uh, taking $20,000 in cash in every few months is a dangerous thing to do because there are highwaymen there, just like there was in the Wild West <laughs> of the U.S. <laughs> so uh, the, the best solution, and the obviously funniest thing to me is, here we are in a war-torn area where the bombs are falling every day. They still have ATMs that are working. <laughs> you know, explain that. <laughs> but they still work. Who else has a question? And I don't know, we have to quit, I guess, sometime here. Somebody tell me to stop when I'm, it's time to stop. Yes. Okay, um, this is a biased report because I only know people who are biased. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian army is defending that part of the country from the secessionists who believe that they ought to be able to speak and negotiate in Russian. That's the language they grew up in, it's a language they prefer, and they do not like it that the government is saying you need to learn Ukrainian in order to do your civil business, such as at court and all of that. So it kind of mushroomed into something where it became a patriotic thing to do to uh, ob object to the government, the Ukrainian government. So when there was sort of a revolt, uh, the Russian government decided they would support uh, the revolt. And so what we have now is uh, uh, Ukrainian people who have formed uh, militias, they're being supported by the Russians, and the Ukrainian army, who were not really prepared for a war, are being supported by America. And so you sort of have a proxy battle going on there that uh, doesn't look like it's going anywhere. It's for five years this has been going on. And they still lob artillery shells back and forth, and once in a while there are bombs that are placed, and, uh, and there's a lot of rifle fire and so on. The war is going on, but it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. But it's dangerous. And that's the reason why the American government and the Ukrainian government advise us not to take Americans into that part of Ukraine. But I want to reassure you that if you go with me to Western Ukraine, it's safe, it's welcoming, and we are welcome. All right, other, other questions? All right, if you don't mind, I'll lead us in a prayer and uh, we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that you have opened the door here in this congregation for us to tell about what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, you know, Father, that uh, there are many things yet to be done and we need wisdom, we need more wise people to help us to do the work as we should. We pray, Father, that you will bless this church and all that they are doing and things that they may decide to do in the future because we know that our passion, really, our passion is your will. And we know that you want all to be saved. And that's what we want too. So, Lord, thank you for this time that we've had together. We pray your blessings on us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.